Hi, I'm Molly Barnes. My guest today is Henry Hopkins, one of the most important people in Los Angeles on the West Coast dealing with art. He started as the director of the Fort Worth Museum, then director of the San Francisco Museum, then director of Los Angeles County Museum, then director of the Ford, of uh, Fred Wiseman's collection, mm -hmm. and most recently the director of the Armand Hammer Museum at UCLA. Now he's retired and he's actually become an artist. <laughs> so it's very exciting to hear this change of pace and to get to know something about Henry. Hi. Hi, Molly. How are you? Fine, thank nice you. Nice to see you on this holiday season. It's here. just wonderful to see you. How did this all get started? When did you know, let's start at the beginning, when did you know <laughs> that you w were interested in art? Oh, heavens, that would go back to the time I was about uh, seven years old, I would guess, in Idaho, where I was born and raised, and nobody else was interested in art. Uh, but it was a time when I would come to Los Angeles in the wintertime and visit my grandparents, and we would go to the Disney films. And uh, I suppose I got most excited with Snow White and uh, decided I wanted to be an animator. As far really? As really? I, didn't, I didn't even know what the word meant. Obviously, yeah, yeah. To me that's what art was. So I, from that moment on, I was drawing assiduously and, and doing a certain amount of painting. And when did you become interested in really working in the art business yourself? Well, that came my, actually much later on. I went through my high school, went through my college, and then went off to the Art Institute of Chicago to study art uh, and being an artist. And then I was drafted into the service in 1952 during the Korean War, but sent off to Germany for two years. And having the opportunity to travel there, I, I saw so many things in context, so much Renaissance art, so much Baroque art, what have you. So I got very interested actually in art history and uh, came back to the Art Institute, finished my master's degree, came to the West Coast to teach and then used my GI Bill to go to UCLA in art history and that kind of began the museum aspect of my career. I think a lot of people, particularly in New York, will disagree with this, but you actually feel that LA is not only the city of the future but will be one of the most important art capitals in the world. Well, I think it's slowly becoming that, and uh, uh, a good friend of mine many years ago, Jim Elliott, said that you know, inevitably Los Angeles will succeed in spite of itself, and that's really more or less what it is. Uh, in the 30 to 40 years I've been involved here, it's like a roller coaster ride. One year is up, one year is down, one year is up, one year is down. One year there are a lot of galleries, next year they've all gone broke, next year the museums are this, that, so forth and so on. But when you think that <coughs> in Los Angeles as such, when you think of the uh, Los Angeles County Museum of Art, built in 1965. Uh, then shortly after that, the uh, Norton Simon Museum, which took over the old Pasadena Museum of, of Contemporary Art. Uh, then the MoCA, then the Getty, then UCLA Hammer. You realize that all of this activity has really taken place in about 45 or 50 years. So just on that growth mode alone, you have to recognize the fact that we've been culturally very active when hardly ever anybody believed it. But then in recent years, I think the big transition has been more in the creative aspect. Our schools, uh, Art Center School, Cal Arts, Otis, uh, Claremont Graduate School, UCLA, uh, all have gained kind of national reputations in terms of turning out young artists. And these young artists are prospering uh, in Europe a lot, uh, in the West Coast, to a certain extent in New York as well. What is your favorite period of American art history? Oh, my. Of American art history? Yeah. Well. I guess I'd have to say that probably the, just at the cusp of the turn of the century with, uh, with people uh, like Thomas Aikens, for example, and then going into the, what they call the Ashcan School, and then the beginnings of modernism with George O'Keefe, and that pretty, that's a wonderful era. You mentioned that, um, that you became interested in art. Um, do you think that art, when it is existing here, reflects the economy that we're dealing with? Do you think that they're separate or together? Oh, no, I think, I think they're absolutely linked, perhaps, in fact, linked much more than they should be, because uh, uh, I think that uh, art essentially follows the economy. In good times, art does very well. In bad times, art doesn't necessarily prosper. 
Uh, there are probably more artists making a living making art now ever than in the history of our country, probably the history of the world, uh, because it's become a kind of false passion or passion, whatever. Uh, but it's also become a business. You know, the uh, making art used to be a thing that people did because they couldn't do anything else, and now it's a thing they do to make a living. It's a it's a change. You've worked in both. What is the <coughs> difference between the public sector and working in the private sector? Well, actually, I think the biggest thing about the public sector and the complexities of it now in terms of the museum world, uh, a museum director who used to be uh, essentially a green shade curator that knew his art and knew his art history, now uh, the job is essentially administration, as you well know. And uh, when it's become administration, that means spending most of your time fundraising, uh, catering to volunteers, dealing with your trustees, which are now trustee groups of 50 and 60 people in a major museum. So uh, it's a full lifestyle. You don't do anything else but that when you do it. How can you tell when an artist is uh, worth, worthy or, or good or somebody that you want to follow? <laughs> do you get it in your gut? or how Well, I think, the, you know? yeah, I think essentially it's in your gut uh, because art is coming from so many different places now. It's coming from right now this moment and ahead of the time it's looking also back into history it's a uh, uh you remember back in the days when you had kind of one critic telling you what art was like Trevor <laughs> exactly. greenberg and, yeah and uh, you believed it now you have 50 different critics that support 50 different artists and 50 different attitudes and ideas so this whole first of all democratization including feminism and latino art and chicano art and black american uh, art uh, and democratization, the spreading out of all of that in the kind of globalist sense, uh, has made the art world infinitely more uh, exciting. Uh, but there's also this very tight little group of uh, essentially collectors and dealers, in my mind, that uh, more or less control the mercantile aspects of the art world, the auction houses as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. When I got into the art world 30 years ago, they said that an art dealer was one of four minorities, uh -huh. gay, Jewish, a woman, or homosexual or as close to all four as you could be <laughs> <laughs> but now it's big business oh, now yeah, it's, absolutely. Yeah. yeah absolutely and uh, it's it's uh, you know it's wonderful because my generation when I went to the museum business uh, I would go to a museum there might be three or four people there so our whole generation uh, spent our time building audience and how do you do audience. that well it's just a, a question of uh, making art more enjoyable, more palatable. It still is an elitist activity and will remain an elitist activity in my mind. But a broader audience uh, and through museums dealing with issues and ideas and art that are closer to our lifetimes. You, you may remember that many museums until about 1970 didn't show the work of living artists. And now it's practically flip-flopped all the way around. When you teach art history, it used to be that you would teach up to maybe 1940 that was in 1960, okay, but now you teach back to 1940. So it's, so there's a complete flip-flop in the way that art history is treated and looked at and heard and people's response to it. One of your gifts is that you can really get very shy artists to open up about their work. Do you feel that artists are different than normal people? Normal people. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I think of an artist as an addict because I think artists have to paint or they, they get sick. Well, that's it's, it's true. They are an addict in, in that way. I, I think my favorite line about that actually came from Robert Irwin, the re, you know, renowned artist. Uh, we were talking, I had a gallery for a short period of time. I there. didn't know that. Where? Uh, on La Cienega Boulevard. I uh, was there for years too. Did we? I was before you. Oh, probably. okay. I what what number? Before. Uh, I was just across the street from the Ferris Gallery. I was, they were at 735, I was at 740 North La Cienega. And Art Forum magazine was there at that time? Art Forum came just after that time because I had then gone on to the L.A. County Museum, but I first showed Joe Good, for example, I first showed Larry Bell. I had uh, no idea. Would have first showed Ed Ruscha, but he went off to Russia, as a matter of fact. But, uh, he was the art director at Art Forum under uh, the name he, of Eddie that's, Russia. That's yeah. correct. Yeah. That's correct. That's correct. So, so but anyway, during that time, Irwin uh, and I were chatting, and, and I said, what is it, Bob, that makes artists different? What makes them kind of prescient about things that go on? He said, Henry, he said, you're full of whatever. Uh, he said, artists aren't prescient. He said, the only difference between artists and other people is that they live in their time. They suck everything out of the air. They suck everything that's right around them every moment. And most people live 15 years before their time, beyond, you know, behind their time. And that's correct. So I believe that all my life. And uh, so I look for those people that are looking for the moment. If you go into a cocktail party, you can spot them? 
Well, <laughs> <laughs> they probably that, rush up that, to that, you. No, that's pretty hard to do. That, that you be know, at Beacon, New York, I'm sure you've been there. Bob Irwin has done the parking lot and all the gardens, all yes, the grounds. Yep. It's just amazing. It is amazing. Yeah, yeah it's, amazing. It's, a, it's a really nice thing. He's been a fascinating artist to, to watch and follow over the years. He began Why? As, well, he began as a, almost as an illustrator uh, and then became an abstract expressionist for a period of time. Then went into his line and dot paintings and his discs, of course, which brought him to international recognition. But since that time, working with the landscape, you know, the Getty Gardens are extraordinary that he did. So. Now, you're working with the Getty now. Well, only in a project that they are partially funding, which I'm delighted about. Uh, they have made a serious five-year commitment to following the history of Los Angeles art from 1950 to 1980. And uh, so they have hired some of us to work with them to be sure that all those archives are saved, that they're secure, that they can be used and available. For I've always thought that out of each art movement or each period, five artists emerge. Who would you say were the the, uh, the first ones to emerge in Los Angeles, maybe follow through every 10 years? Oh, in Los Angeles? Well, yeah. I think probably <coughs> now we're going back in time because many of them that were not so recognized at their moment are now gaining more recognition. Exactly. Do you think that's the dealer that's doing that or just people are well, saying? Well, I think people are, no, I think, uh, again, you asked me this question about Los Angeles and its importance as a cultural center for some reason that I can't fully define, suddenly everybody is terribly excited about our past. You know, in Los Angeles has always been tomorrow, 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 and now it's all, not all looking back, but some is. And uh, so you can go back to Stanton McDonald Wright, you know, the old hero of European art, actually. And then uh, people like Lorister Feidelson, John McLaughlin, for example, Helen Lundeberg, all of those artists are now gaining a little more credibility uh, as history begins to evolve, and I think in every way they were as interesting as George O'Keefe and, and the rest of them. But uh, and then of the next generation, uh, probably you'd have to come up then to people like Richard Diebenkorn, for example, and Sam Francis, and, and uh, Robert Irwin, for, for sure, and, and others. And then it kind of opens up in a much broader spread in the 1960s with people like Ed Ruscha and Joe Good and Larry Bell and Peter Alexander and and, and on up, but now uh, the kids are just out of school and they're showing in Europe and they're showing in Documenta and uh, Venice Biennale, it's amazing. People so, seem to feel that the, that the um, art fairs now are where art is really happening. It's uh, even more so than galleries. Well, I've always appreciated the art fair for two reasons. One, you get a really broad cross-section, you get a real diversity, and whether that's in the uh, Baron Show or wherever, uh, but the may other thing, too, that helps me as a, as a uh, viewer, people won't like to hear me say this, but uh, in most cases they put their prices up on the wall, and they, you never can do that in a gallery, and, it, and you get tired of asking and tired of asking. So you learn more. You really see a lot, and you see a cross-section, and you've got a certain idea of how this dealer works and how this artist works with them and, and uh, how they develop them and how they grow. And, uh, so. I think it's a great, the art fairs are a great education for any young kid that's getting involved in the business of art. Yeah. Actually, in New York, you're, you, you are forced to put the price list up on the wall. It's a law, but no one ever does it. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Uh -huh. So you've had a good time. I, you, you've talked to me in the past of the L.A. artists having a hard time breaking into the New York art scene mm -hmm. and yes. actually having to go to, to Europe. Yeah. Well, it's not a, really a question of having to go to Europe. It just was a, a, a natural phenomenon. Uh, London, uh, Paris to a certain extent, Germany, Italy have always been extraordinarily interested in the West Coast, probably because of the film industry and Hollywood and the other things that relate to it. Uh, but they have always come out and looked at the artists here and, and quite often, back in the 60s, as I say, with people like Ed Ruscha, they were all, Joe Good, they were all showing in European galleries but never showing in New York at that time. And the two or three times when artists were given the opportunity to show in New York, I think of Billy Al Bankston, for example, uh, it simply was not successful. New York simply didn't relate to what right, L.A. Right. was doing. Right. Now let's hear about your own work. I was so surprised to find out <laughs> what a wonderful artist you are and how many shows you've already had. Well, <laughs> in, in, in a relatively short period of time. <laughs> exactly. Well, I, when I was in the museum business, obviously, uh, I felt two things. One, that it was a conflict of interest, which I think it is, making your own art. And secondly, since you have passions, you know, you can only really develop one passion. If you get two going, it's, it's a real problem. So 
I didn't want to be working in the museum and thinking about my art. I didn't want to be working on my art thinking about the museum. So I quit, essentially. I did draw uh, through that whole time, and I did a little show at Janie Lee's gallery in Dallas and a little show with John McGruin to stop Proposition 13, you know, back in the, in the 80s, but essentially didn't produce a lot. But I said that when I did retire, uh, which I did two years ago, I would then get back to making art, and then you have to say, is that true or is that a lie? You know, you've been saying that all these years, it's just a fib. So well, did I, you draw or sketch at night or on trips? Did you plan at all what you would do in terms of subject no, matter? I th no, no, I thought about it. I thought about what I would like to do and where I would be, and uh, kind of technically, I, there, there are certain very specific things. I don't work large. Uh, by that I mean six by eight feet, okay? The painting here between us is about, what, I don't know, two and a half by three feet. And, and we're looking oh. at some of these now. Okay, these were all done the last working. two years? These were all done within the last year, year and a half. I began working with Japanese watercolor, which is kind of an opaque watercolor, which I was very fond of as a medium, very bright, it worked well and easily. Uh, and I worked in that in small scale, probably 10 by 12 inches, you know, and. Uh, and produced a number of things. I, I like the idea of having a theme. Uh, people ask me why flowers or plant life, and I, I say, well, maybe perversity, but you know, because after all, who paints flowers? Uh, but my father was an agronomist, uh, and as an agronomist, I grew up with a great affection for all living things in, in plant form and plant, li plant life. So I felt there was a lot to be explored, and then also I felt that, uh, that flowers uh, in principle, can tell stories. I mean, it, it, you know, do, do you think about the uh, <coughs> all of the religious symbolism in terms of flowers over the history of art and uh, history of mankind? So I've been dealing with things like dance of life, which that painting is. Now this is talking about the beginning of life, the middle, and then the end, right? Yeah, dying. based on Monk's painting, dance of life. But uh, but the flowers are telling the story instead, or doing a contrast between contemporary and, and uh, you know, Mondrian-like. Mondrian Mondrian -like Could all that, these you know, flowers exist at the same time in real life? Oh yeah, these are all roses, and I, and I usually work from the original flower. I work from the flower, and as I say, the great concern is that it dies before I get it painted, but that's... Now in this um, one, you actually have uh, roots in Los Angeles. Well, that's LA 2000, right? And this is one based on a Dolly painting, and this is a one I do it up in my cabin in Idaho. Uh, because that's where all these little sago lilies come out that are so that are so beautiful, but uh, but essentially I felt that well this one's called rape for example the gardenia from a high school prom and then being covered with the terrible things that happened so I try to deal with social issues when they come up. What about this one? Uh, this is called acid rain, uh, and uh, you can see the rain is coming down and burning the leaves of the flowers. So I deal with the environment. I deal with art history. It's uh, I, I was talking to myself the other day, and I was saying, all right, if you do another show, <coughs> what, what would you call it? And I decided it would be something old, something new, something borrowed, something blue, because it, it all comes from someplace, someplace else, as far as that's concerned. So, Do you talk to yourself a lot? Well, on occasion. <laughs> <laughs> do you have dialogue? In my head, I don't actually have a, a, a running a verbal <laughs> dialogue, but... but it, I certainly chat with myself in my head. In each of those pieces, it's almost mm. as if you've been uh, influenced by a particular artist. Uh, in many cases, that's true. Uh, there are certain artists that I have high regard for and respect. And uh, if you asked me about American art earlier, if you asked me about my favorite period of art in general, it probably would be that period around the symbolists uh, at about the turn of the century, you know, Gauguin. And, 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 well, yeah, no, no, no the, not the Americans, the Europeans. Uh, around... Uh, uh, Gauguin and Munk and, the, you know, the, after the post-impressionist, post and I've always thought that's a monumental territory, that area of symbolism that's never been mined as fully as it could be mined. Really? But, but it requires also working at essentially what, well, what my art is, uh, much more figuratively, you know, as opposed to abstraction. Though I have the greatest admiration for uh, abstract and non-objective art, uh, a narrative aspect of that seems to be a natural thing built into me, so I like the storytelling aspect of it. Give me an example. Well, what kind of an example can I give you? Can we look at this one painting yeah. here for one, one second? I can give you some little clue maybe to that. Uh, it's a, as you can see, it's a painting essentially of uh, uh, cattails, uh, again up at my cabin in, in Idaho. 
Uh, and I was looking at them one day, looking at the little pond and the marsh, and for some reason I was thinking about uh, the concept of Peter Bruegel's painting called Icarus. Right. Okay, where the sun is setting and Icarus's little legs are sticking out of the, the water. So I made the painting that and called it Icarus. So you have the, the cattails, the marsh, the pond, the sun setting in the back. You have the hole that Icarus has gone into, into the water, and a couple of little feathers floating down in the thing. And then, so obviously I'm looking at Bruegel, but I also, strangely enough, in the middle of that, uh, though it has nothing to do with that, I was thinking about Giotto and how he brought things so they all looked together kind of toward one point. But usually one thing was not paying attention the same way that the others were. So it's kind of a contrast, good, bad, light, dark, love, hate, all those elements. So of all of these cattails that are all kind of turned friendly, they're kind of little uh, living eye or living head, what have you. The one over there on the left is turned with its back. He's the only one watching what's happening there. Remember the L.A. artist Ed Moses, what he did the silver point, and oh, all sure. the birds would be looking one way and one looking the other That's one? That's right. The other <laughs> way. Right. Well, Ed and I were trained more or less at the same time at UCLA, as a matter of fact. Really? Right. Now, Icarus, is that a, an applicable parable about life for you today? For me, it is. Sure it is. We, yeah. we hear so many people refer to that well, myth. You're flying too close to the sun. It's a, it's, a, uh, it's a time now, you know, we could go on endlessly, as, as uh, talking heads do on television all the time. Uh, the uh, simple aspect of is has science gone too far? Have genetics gone too far? Have we destroyed our environment? Have we done this? Have we done that? And those are all relatable to the Icarus parable, so that's why I like it. Uh -huh. What are some of the other ones you're going to tackle in the future? Well, Dance of Life, as I say, is, is certainly one of them. I, I'm thinking about doing a uh, painting on Ophelia. It was a wonderful uh, painting uh, by a British artist, whose name suddenly I'm going to forget. Uh, that I've always liked of this this feminine, lovely feminine creature floating down a river and what have you, but I, I won't use the figure, I'll use flowers to tell the story, but essentially it'll be that, and that's kind of the passing of life and uh, and using uh, uh, Yorick's skull there to the, and Hamlet's thing, you're going to relate to all of those different, uh, different ideas. Uh, I'm going to probably do one called Borders, uh, which I worked out in small scale once before, which would have to do with a group of sunflowers, kind of the southern Mexican thematic, caught on a barbed wire fence with a division between us and them. And, uh, and I am probably going to rework one that I did a year ago called Bush Cheney, which has to do with the destruction of the, of the forest and things of that kind. So that's for my effect. I came to your, to your home the other day, and your studio is very small. Do you <laughs> think studio size legislates the size of a canvas well, for I, artists? Well, yes, I would say it, it certainly can uh, and does. Uh, you know, uh, Paul Clay worked his lifetime at a kitchen table. So, really? And, uh, so, and there's not much in Paul Clay's work beyond two, two by three feet or three by four feet. I think it's more the nature of the of the person, you know, and their the way they function. I just happen to uh, uh, unavoidably work in small scale and work in kind of minute detail. It's just the way I am. Uh, uh, but others, of course, like like Ed Moses, whom you mentioned, like the giant wall space, the big open brush stroke, and the other things that, that go with it. Uh, so, it I but I also I think. In, real, in reality, I judged a jury to show in Alaska uh, several years ago, and I was amazed that everything was about 8 by 10 inches, 10 by 12 inches, you know, something of that kind. And I said, that was in the middle of big painting, and I, and I said to somebody, I said, this is amazing that everybody works so small. We said, well, if you were locked in nine months out of the year in the snow <laughs> and the ice and the cold, what else to go? What else can you do? <laughs> Remember when the P and D school started, and they they would butt uh, paintings together, and it turned out that they couldn't get big paintings down that's freight right. elevators. That's right. Exactly. That's right. So they had to begin to put them together like Ellsworth Kelly and the others. I, I, right do now. you work on a nine to uh, five now that you're retired? Do you work uh, systematically on a schedule? In, in my painting, you mean? Yes. Or, well, yes. I have several different things going on. I try to work every day, and I and I actually it's something I learned from Judy Chicago. Uh, where she was being so torn by so many different things that she said, okay, the only way that you're ever going to make art is to say, I'm going to do it every day, six hours a day, no matter what. And I had no idea she said that. Yeah, and, that's, uh, and so that, it, it's a very good principle. You know, it's the same principle you use when you're writing, same principle you use when you're doing other things. So it's a, uh, yeah. 
The art world has changed so much since we came into it. <laughs> <laughs> even more since I came into it. Tell me. I mean, not even in terms of style. I mean, for example, when um, uh, Gorky, or I can't remember who it was, Phil Gustin started painting mm -hmm. realistic. Yep. His friends all dropped him and started yep. picketing the shows. Well, but the, th but the thing about Phil Gustin, as you know, he's a great national hero now because he's just had another major retrospective. But I've known Phil Gustin a larger part of my life. Uh, I installed his first exhibition at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, and we became friends. And I remember then, somebody did a documentary yeah, about you with him. That's yeah. right, yeah. And then I did his show in San Francisco, which was after his return to figuration. But for me, Gustin began as a figurative artist, and all through the 1930s, he was dealing with images not like unlike the Ku Klux Klan people that he was dealing with. He was very much a socialist in his, in his political views. Uh, so actually, the aberration in Gustin's life is not the figure, the aberration is the abstraction. Okay. I have one final minute, so I want to ask you one, que mm -hmm. one uh, question based on that. Do you think art can change people's ideas ecologically, spiritually? Uh, you mean other than the artist, you mean? No, do you think a piece of art has the power to change somebody? Oh, I think, oh, uh, yes, I think so. Uh, I, <laughs> one of my favorite cartoons was in The New Yorker, and I think it was Saul Steinberg, but I'm not sure. But it's a woman in the Museum of Modern Art looking at a Mondrian, and it's a little grandmother who's 80 and she's standing there with a handkerchief with a tear in her eye. <laughs> and, uh, and so I've always just been so amused by that. But, <laughs> but yes, you know, art, music, literature all has the opportunity of being able to change. Not just soothe. You feel it, can, it actually sure. can change. Sure. Yeah, exactly. Well, Henry, I cannot anger. thank you enough. This has been such a treat for me to finally get to spend time with you and uh, to get your undivided attention. You, <laughs> you give so much to so many people. Great and to be with you. Thank you. you. Art is not for everyone. It never has been. It never will be. But for those of you who love it like we do, we want to turn you on. I'm Molly Barnes.